How's it going, Eliminators? Today I'm going to be showing you how a carburetor works. So let's get right into it. So over the years I've done countless numbers of videos on how to clean a carburetor, but I've never really explained how a carburetor works. So today we're going to be doing that. So I have in front of me a basic uh, Honda carburetor for Honda engines. A lot of Kohlers use this type of carburetor, but this one's perfect because it has a pilot jet on it and it also has an air fuel mixture screw, which I'm going to get into that shortly. But uh, this is your average carburetor for a lawnmower. Basically, all carburetors are essentially the same. The job of a carburetor is to mix air with fuel into an air fuel mixture and then put that into the engine. So on this side here, you have your choke lever so when you want to start your engine this little lever right there closes so as the piston comes down on the intake stroke with this choke plate closed the carburetor has a little bit more suction into it and what that extra little bit of suction does is it just helps pull a little bit more fuel through the main jet or the distribution tube which is that little brass piece in the middle there so the choke is only used for starting your engine and it will run rough if you leave the choke on while your engine is running because again it's creating more suction you're getting less air and more fuel into the mixture which is known as a rich mixture we'll get into mixtures in a little bit but essentially it just creates too much fuel and not enough air inside of your carburetor which will bog down your engine Moving over to our throttle plate here, or our throttle butterfly valve, this will limit the amount of air going through your engine. So more air, higher RPM, less air, lower RPM. And this up here is normally hooked up to a lever or a cable that goes back to a governor in the case of a lawnmower with a governor linkage. Now, if this is on a go-kart or a mini bike, this will just be hooked up to a cable. And then when you get on the throttle, it opens up the butterfly valve and that's full throttle, also known as wide open throttle. That's about three quarter throttle. And then that's closed where it normally idles. Now you're gonna be wondering if that throttle plate is closed, there's no air going through here. How does your engine still run? if that is in fact on the idle. Now this is where we come to what's known as the pilot jet, but it's also called the idle jet. And that's right in here. So I'm gonna pull that out and show you guys what that is. Now to get that pilot jet out, we're gonna to have to remove the screw there. And that's also known as your throttle backstop. What that does is it sets where your throttle is going to be set at the closed position. So by moving that farther in, your throttle plate won't close as far and your engine will idle at a higher RPM. So that is known as an idle screw or a throttle backstop screw. So I've now removed the pilot jet and you guys can see that there's a couple little O-rings on it and there is a hole going through this side here and there is a little brass jet and you guys can see that there is a hole in there. And like I said, this is your pilot jet but it's also known as your idle jet. So this is what regulates the amount of fuel going into your engine when your machine is idling and not under load. Now pilot jets on different machines are gonna be different on a lot of these Kohler and Honda carburetors. They look like this. I've done a video on how to bore one of these out on, I believe it was a LCT engine on a snowblower. The engine is surging. It's just not getting enough fuel and it's just getting a little bit too much air. And the thing to do is just to bore that hole out so that your idle circuit, as it's called, gets a little bit more fuel and it will smooth out that RPM. So you can check out that video in the top right of your screen if you'd like. And I also did a video on how to fix surging on a Nikki carburetor. The pilot jet on that carburetor was not removable. However, it works just the same. You just find the idle jet and you're able to bore it out slightly oversized, which just allows a little bit more fuel through and fixes the surging. Moving on to the bowl of the carburetor, and this is what holds the fuel so that you can always have fuel for what's known as on-demand throttle use or on-demand load. So whenever you get on the throttle, this has a constant supply of fuel in here, and I'm going to remove this bowl by removing this bolt right here. That's your drain bolt, so in the fall time, if you ever want to drain out the bowl of your carburetor, all you do is shut off your inline fuel shutoff valve, and then you can go ahead and remove that bolt and drain your bowl so that there's not a bunch of fuel sitting in there because it can get gummed up. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this, and then I'll bring you back and show you the float and the needle valve. Okay, so we now have the bowl off of the carburetor. It exposes the float and the needle valve. 
valve, which I'll get into in a moment. This here is your bowl gasket, and that just helps make a seal so that you don't leak any fuel out of the bowl. And normally on these bowls, there's going to be a sediment reservoir, which is just essentially a dip in the bottom of the bowl, and that will catch all of the sediment that goes into the bottom there because gravity is going to pull that down. And if you're not running an inline fuel filter, it'll go into your carburetor and hopefully won't get sucked up into your main jet. And we'll talk about the main jet in a moment, but first I'm going to be talking about the float and the needle valve. So here we have what's known as a float and they call it a float because it floats on the fuel. So we have to think about this as the carburetor would normally be bolted, which is in this position here. And you guys can see that the float is not floating. And that's because there's no fuel or liquid inside of the bowl of the carburetor. So just imagine that there's a clear bowl on the bottom of this carburetor and we could see through this. So what happens is when you turn your fuel valve on or you pour gasoline into your fuel tank and you don't have an inline fuel shutoff valve, fuel is gonna go into this inlet here. And that inlet goes all the way back down that little valley right there into your fuel inlet right there and that is known as your needle valve seat, that brass piece right there. And once I get the float and the needle valve out, you'll have a little better look of that. But we're gonna imagine that this carburetor is bolted onto a machine. So you have a constant supply of fuel going into your inlet. As fuel fills the bowl, it's going to close the float because the plastic will float on the liquid. What that does is it pushes the needle valve into your seat. See that right there? Now this one has a spring, and normally that is just to absorb a little bit of vibration. So if you have an engine that vibrates a lot, or let's say this was on a mini bike, what'll happen is when your bowl is filled with fuel, every time you hit a bump, the float will move a little bit, but the needle valve will still be seated. You see that? So only the spring is moving right now but the needle valve is gonna remain closed. And what that does is essentially it just keeps the fuel from going into your distribution tube and your main jet, and it will prevent your engine from flooding while you're hitting bumps. So basically, if it didn't have that spring, every time you hit a bump on, let's say a mini bike, that float would open and it would put more fuel into your carburetor. And your carburetor may not need that fuel, and that's called flooding out your engine because it would be getting too much fuel or that's just simply running rich. So that's how a float and a needle valve works. And right in the center of this post here, that is what's known as your main jet. So that meters the amount of fuel going into what's known as your distribution tube. Now in this particular carburetor, the design has a bolt holding the bowl on, and that goes into this long tube here. Now you're gonna notice these holes on the sides of that tube. What that does is it allows fuel from the bowl to go into the center tube, and then that fuel supplies your main jet. On other types of carburetors for the old Tecumsehs, what you'll notice is they don't have these holes. What they do is they have a hole in the actual brass bolt, and that takes the fuel from the bowl through the brass bolt, and then that lets fuel into this little tube here. So I have one of my Tecumseh snowblower carburetors here, and that's essentially what it is. There's just a bolt there, and I'm gonna remove that and show you what it looks like. So on this particular carburetor design, your fuel would go from your bowl in through the big hole on the top there, and they have holes on both sides, and then it would let the fuel through that little hole there, and then from there, it would go back down into your distribution tube, see that? Now this carburetor that I have in front of you, this is also for a snowblower, and the previous carburetor just had a bolt going in to hold the bowl in. That's what's known as a fixed main jet, so there's no adjustments that you can make to that carburetor, whereas this is known as an adjustable main. So this brass bolt or screw here also has the holes in it, but on this one it has a needle that goes in, so by putting this farther in, you're limiting the fuel that's going into the main jet, and by unthreading this, you're increasing the amount of fuel that's going into the main jet. So these carburetors are a lot nicer, especially the ones that have an air fuel mixture screw. I'll get to that in a moment, but what you do to make an adjustment on this carburetor is you adjust your main jet in until it starts sputtering, you adjust it out until it starts sputtering, and then you find the center point, and then you go ahead and adjust your air fuel mixture screw, which 
again, I'll get to in a second. Now, like I said, adjustable carburetors are the best simply because if your engine starts running rough, you can go ahead and use a small slotted screwdriver and it's quite simple. Pretty much everyone has one of them and you're able to make a quick adjustment on your machine and keep it running so that you don't have to go and take it into a shop for an expensive repair bill. Most of the times you'll just be able to make a small little adjustment. What you're gonna find nowadays though is that they set these from the factory and then they break them off or they put some type of epoxy over top of them so that you cannot make adjustments and that's just simply because of government regulations. So the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, they don't want you adjusting your fuel mixture because you can pollute the environment more. So they come preset from the factory and if one of the little holes inside of this carburetor gets a little bit of dirt in it, you can't go ahead and back that screw out to give it a little bit more fuel. You have to take the carburetor off and clean it. That's the only way to make them run right. But now I'm going to remove what's known as the float rod. So that's just a rod on the two posts here that hold your float into position. Sometimes they can get stuck and I have a video that I did showing you guys how to remove one of those if they are seized in position. If you want to see that video, you can click the link in the top right of your screen. But by removing that float rod, it allows us to pull up the float and the needle valve. So the job of the needle valve is to make a seal in between your seat, which is right there, and the needle valve itself. So again, as the fuel goes into your carburetor, it pushes up on that needle valve and just simply makes a seal. You're going to have two different kinds of needle valves. You're gonna have a rubber tipped needle valve like this one with a metal seat, or you're going to have a rubber seat with a metal needle valve. Now, I like the brass or metal seat with the rubber needle valve because even though they're a little bit more expensive, they generally seal up a little better. Now it might not look like it's rubber because of the reflection, but I can promise you it is a rubber tipped needle valve. And again, I explained the purpose of that spring there just to absorb a little bit of shock. Here is what the seat looks like. So that hole has been drilled to a specific size and that will let a certain amount of fuel into the bowl. So getting a little bit more complex on higher performance vehicles like uh, ATVs and dirt bikes, you'll be able to customize your seats. So a larger hole in your seat will give you a richer supply of fuel into the bowl, which means your bowl will fill faster and a leaner seat will have a small hole which will fill your bowl slower. Now the idea behind that is let's say you're on the throttle a lot and you're using the fuel in the bowl very quickly. What's going to happen is because the fuel supply goes through here if your bowl can't fill as fast as the supply of fuel that's getting taken out of the bowl then what you do is you just go ahead and run a richer seat and that normally solves that issue. Now you can also get into setting the float because on this type here there is no adjustment on it. It's plastic. If you try to bend it, then it will break. But on a lot of machines, you're gonna have a brass float. And if we come down here, you'll notice that the float is level. So you always wanna level your float guys with the carburetor right there. So even though the float rod isn't in, it might not be sitting perfectly level. But generally speaking, you wanna level your float so that when the fuel comes into your carburetor, it closes the float at the correct time. If you run your float higher, it will close sooner. And if you run your float lower, it will close later. And that is a little bit more complex. And on these types of carburetors, you really don't have to deal with that too much. All you guys have to remember is you wanna keep your float as level as possible. Now, after I've reinstalled a float and a needle valve onto a carburetor, before I go to put the carburetor back onto the machine, I do what's known as a pressure test. So pressure testing the needle valve, essentially that just gives me an idea that the carburetor will not leak fuel because of a leaky needle valve before I go ahead and reassemble everything. So the tool here is simply an air pump and you guys can see there's a gauge on top of it. It goes up to about 30 PSI. Normally I test carburetors up to about five PSI and you simply pump the plunger there and it supplies air through the line. Now on this carburetor, the fuel inlet is a little bit smaller than the tube here, but essentially what you're doing is you're just pressurizing that needle valve. And if you hear air coming out when the float is in the down position, then you'll know that your needle valve is leaking. So if you lift your float and your needle valve is up, you should hear air coming out. And if you drop your float and your needle valve is closed, you should not hear air coming out. And this gauge here should read up to about five PSI and it will hold there. If your needle valve leaks, you'll see the gauge slowly dropping down. 
If you wanna see that video, I'll link it in the top right of your screen now so you guys can check that out. So if you ever pull the dipstick on your machine and you notice that you have what looks to be like oil way up on your dipstick and it looks like your engine is overfilled with oil, what you wanna do is go ahead and smell the dipstick. If the oil smells like fuel, then chances are you have a leaky needle valve on your carburetor. So I'm just out on my patio and I have a rototiller here that has a carburetor that is located below the intake manifold. So this is where the air comes in through your air filter and it's introduced into the carburetor from the bottom on this type of design and the fuel comes in through here and your float is in here. Now what happened on this one is it has a leaky needle valve so I'm gonna have to go ahead and fix that but when this carburetor floods because the carburetor is located below the intake manifold our engine is not going to flood with fuel. On other machines, you're gonna have the carburetor here and it's gonna have an intake manifold that runs horizontally into your intake port. And what's gonna happen is the fuel will go from that carburetor down the intake manifold and then into your engine. And I can show you guys what that looks like. Oh, well that's no good. That's no good at all. That's gas in the bottom end of the engine, folks. That's what happens when you have a leaky needle valve on your carburetor and you don't have a fuel shutoff valve. It's still going. So on this particular Craftsman, it just has a 12 and a half horsepower Briggs and Stratton. The fuel line normally comes out of the tank and then comes through this hole in the frame here and then comes straight down to your carburetor without any fuel shutoff valves or inline fuel filters. What I do, on these particular machines because there's plenty of room is you come up under here you put a fuel line you run your inline fuel filter right there you come under your throttle choke cable and then you run your shutoff valve right there so this carburetor has been rebuilt the needle valve has been replaced and I pressure tested it before I changed this line so I know that the needle valve holds fuel and that it won't leak into the bottom end so what my customer can do is that's to run your machine and then in the fall time he can shut this off and he can run his carburetor dry. Now what that does is it prevents the fuel from having a constant pressure on the float, which then puts a constant pressure on the needle valve. So a constant pressure on, let's say, a rubber tip needle valve will actually cause the rubber to deform and you'll get a little ring around the rubber tip and what will happen is it will leak over time. Now if you compare that to a metal needle valve, this won't deform. However, the rubber seat in which the metal needle valve seats onto, right? Those little rubber things there. That will actually deform as well because you're always pressing that steel needle valve into the rubber seat. So it will end up getting enlarged and then that will leak as well. So just running an inline fuel shutoff valve makes things so much easier. You just shut your fuel off. You can run your carburetor dry. There's still gonna be a little bit of fuel in the bottom of the bowl, but if you want to go a step further, once your engine dies out, you can crack the bull bolt there loose and then drain the rest of the fuel into a little jar at the end of the season, put it away for winter and your engine would be good to go. And removing the spark plug and turning your engine over to get the rest of the fuel out of the cylinder is also a good idea. Should do that in a well ventilated area. Now on an engine with one of these, this is known as an inline fuel pump. So the fuel comes in on one side and is going out to the carburetor. On the other side, it is run by crankcase pressure. So as your piston comes down in the cylinder, it creates a positive pressure in your crankcase, which moves a diaphragm in here one way. And then when your piston goes up in the cylinder, it creates a negative pressure in your crankcase, which pulls a little diaphragm the other way. And with the continuous running of your engine, there is always a pulse inside of this fuel pump. And that's what will pump the fuel through your fuel line. So on a machine that has a fuel line going from the fuel tank directly to the carburetor, that's what's known as gravity fed. Whereas if the engine has one of these, this is a fuel pump, then it's a fuel pump operated machine. So with that being said, 
If you have an engine with a fuel pump and you notice there's a bunch of gasoline in your oil, chances are you just have a pinhole in your diaphragm. So every time the piston goes up in your cylinder and creates a negative pressure in your crankcase, what's gonna happen is a little bit of fuel is gonna go through that pinhole and it's gonna go through the tube that goes from your fuel pump back into your crankcase and that's how the fuel is introduced into your oil on a machine with one of these guys. But moving on to the main jet, you can see there on the brass main jet there is a slot and you can simply use a slotted screwdriver. So this is just your basic average slotted screwdriver that I've taken to the bench grinder to grind down on the width and also just a little bit taken off of the profile and the thickness of the screwdriver itself. And what that does is it just allows me to go inside of that tube and remove the main jet here. So I'll get that out and I'll show you what that looks like. So here we have our main jet and you guys can see that there is a hole that goes through there. So the number one cause of engines that don't start is simply a clogged main jet. So what happens is a little bit of debris and sediment gets in there, a little bit of old gasoline gums up. So that's normally what limits your amount of fuel. So you're gonna go and pull the pull cord on your lawnmower and it's not gonna start and it's simply because it's not getting enough fuel. But getting back to the main jet itself, if you want a richer mixture, so more fuel and less air, what you're gonna do is you're gonna run a bigger main jet, so it's gonna be a larger diameter hole. If you want a leaner fuel mixture, more air and less fuel, you're gonna run a smaller diameter hole. Now, underneath your main jet is going to be what's known as your distribution tube. Now, I've oiled this up just so that it came out a little easier. Sometimes they can just get a little seized in there. You're going to notice that it's simply a tube with a long hole in it, and it has a bunch of smaller holes all the way down the tube here. So this is known as your distribution tube, but also your emulsion tube. So as the fuel comes from your bowl through your main jet, it's going to bypass this emulsion tube and all of these tiny little holes are gonna turn the liquid fuel into more of a mist because we have to remember that in this part of the carburetor here, the bottom of your carburetor, there's only gonna be fuel. The fuel isn't introduced until it gets into this chamber here, which runs horizontally this way. So that emulsion tube basically takes the liquid fuel and turns it into a mist. So by the time it's introduced to the air, then it can mix easily and it makes burn more efficiently because if you just sprayed some liquid fuel into your engine it's not going to burn as efficiently whereas if you spray in a mist it's going to burn more efficiently finally we move on to our air fuel mixture screw so on a lot of these carburetors you're going to notice that there's all kinds of holes we can see at the front here little brass jets and those are fixed jets so they've been drilled to a specific size and the job of those is to let air pass. So again, going back to how does your machine idle if the throttle plate here is closed? Well, these little holes here let air pass. So these holes are what supply your engine with air when your machine is idling. And your pilot jet here is what supplies it with the fuel when it's idling. As soon as you open up your throttle and you put your engine under a load, it starts pulling fuel through the main jet. The big thing here about this air fuel mixture screw is you guys can see that the hole is right here and it runs along a valley. But the air fuel mixture screw here is the same type of principle as the other main jet adjuster needle that I showed you on the carburetor. In that case though, the needle adjusted the amount of fuel going into the main jet. The air fuel mixture screw adjusts the amount of air going into your engine. So if we think back to our mixtures, more air and less fuel means a lean mixture, but also less fuel and the same amount of air can mean a lean mixture, whereas more fuel and less air can be a rich mixture, but less air and the same amount of fuel can also be a rich mixture. So essentially, if your carburetor has an air tube going through there, the farther in this screw is, the richer it's going to be because you're restricting air. And the farther out this screw is, the leaner your machine is gonna run because you're introducing more air into your air fuel mixture. But that's pretty much it for explaining how a carburetor works. It can seem a little complex, especially on V-twin engines, and it has what's known as a dual barrel carburetor. And taking one of these things apart, guys, is pretty complex. You can see just how many parts there is on my workbench there. Whereas these carburetors here, it's a little simpler because there's a little bit less parts, but essentially every carburetor works the same. Like I said, the job of a carburetor is to simply mix a metered amount of fuel with air and then supply that to your engine. So that's it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed learning about how a carburetor works. If you did, think about leaving me a thumbs up. You know, it really helps me out. 
You can click here to subscribe and click over here to watch one of my previous videos. I upload every single week, so be sure to stop on by next week. Check the channel out for new content. And as always, guys, thanks for watching.